Tempo and Mode in Evolution was actually the title of George Gaylord Simpson's contribution to the modern synthesis. We talked about this earlier in the second lecture, remember? Our next area of focus is about the mode of evolution and how it affects the tempo, but what interests us here are things that developed well after Simpson in the last decades of the 20th century. Punctuated Equilibrium Okay, so when I was in grad school, one of the debates raging in evolutionary biology was between one side, which was my side, sort of, because of where I went to school, where you had the neo-Darwinists. Well, on the other side, you had the punk eakers, adherents to the school of punctuated equilibrium and all of its glorious ramifications. In order to understand the question here, you want to note that the fossil record shows almost invariantly that morphological evolution is discontinuous, with distinct fossil species and generally no intermediate forms, that is, no fossils of transitional intermediates between the distinct morphologies. In the fossil record for horses, for example, you have morphologically consistent Meohippus, which disappears around the time when a different, and also morphologically consistent species, Merichahippus, becomes the dominant horse of the area. Now, there may be plenty of evidence that one is the ancestor of the other, but what you don't see is evidence of Meohippus turning into Merichahippus through a gradation of intermediate fossils. It's like one turned into the other without leaving any trace of the transition. And we can presume that it wasn't Tinkerbell having a fit and magicking all the horses into a different species, but we have to accept that this transition happened too quickly to have been documented by the fossils. Remember that the conditions required for fossilization are extremely rare. We don't have that many fossils even for a horse species that thrived for a period of two million years. And so, a substantial amount of morphological change taking place over 20,000 years, a measly 20,000 years in comparison with a two million year period of existence for the species, could very well have occurred without leaving any fossils. The big debate had to do with whether or not a regular Darwinian path of gradual change accumulating over many generations is adequate to account for such apparently rapid change. Neo-Darwinians said basically yes, it's entirely possible. If the horse generation is on average five years, 20,000 years is 4,000 generations, which is totally enough time for a really large amount of change to unfold very gradually as an accumulation of micro-sized steps from generation to generation. The punk eakers said that, given the near-complete absence of intermediate fossils, these changes must be occurring over a much shorter time frame. If it really were 20,000 years, then you would expect to see more intermediate forms than we actually do, and therefore the period of change must be dozens, or at most hundreds of generations, rather than thousands. And as such, we may need to account for much of that change by mutations of larger effect, larger than what we had envisioned when we talked about mutation as a source for the allelic variation that you have in a population or species. So in the general understanding of mutation that we came to earlier, you should be thinking about extraordinarily rare events that contribute gradually to the standing amount of heritable phenotypic variation by making new alleles with tiny, almost imperceptible effects on phenotype. There's nothing in that picture that would allow for mutations of larger effects that have some major impact on the evolutionary trajectory of the population. And whether such mutations were or were not important in evolution was a subject of heated debate. Now keep in mind that I was educated in a program that was firmly on the side of neo-Darwinism. With the advantage of hindsight some 30 plus years later, I have the opportunity to skip past all of the drama and point out some of the valuable things that have emerged from our deeper thinking about how a single mutation could potentially cause a substantial amount of change without outright killing the organism. That's the problem, see? In our normal picture of molecular genetics, a gene is something that codes for a specific gene product, usually a protein 
And this protein presumably does something important for the cell in which the gene is expressed. If you make a random change in the DNA of the gene that has any substantial large effect on the gene's protein product, the most likely outcome is that the protein will be disabled. But maybe if the effect is tiny enough, it might be tolerated or possibly even an improvement. But this mutation has to be really small. Any mutation of large effect and the organism will be harmed. And so the large effect mutation would be quickly eliminated by natural selection. Such mutations that are immediately weeded out are not going to have any impact on a population's evolution. The only mutations that are allowable are those with tiny, tiny effects. The idea that a single mutation could cause a big change to an organism and that this change would be good for fitness was perfectly preposterous. This is where the state of knowledge was in the late 1980s when I was in grad school. In the time since, the field of developmental biology and specifically evolutionary developmental biology or EVO-DEVO has come of age. Basically, we now recognize that the genes that we were talking about, the ones with gene products that are important and non-negotiable entities in any viable cell, they're only one class of genes. There's another class, the developmental genes, whose products are responsible for turning other genes on when and where they're needed. If you've taken a general biology class, you might be familiar with the transcription factors in eukaryotic cells. These are basically proteins and other molecules that interact with lots of other molecules in complex ways. And this whole set of molecules is what controls whether or not a gene gets transcribed in the nucleus of the cell. If you happen to have the right cocktail transcription factors, the gene is turned on. Otherwise, it's off. Each of these transcription factors is coded for by a gene, a developmental gene. And there are thousands of these genes working behind the scenes not really making any protein that's important for the cell's day-to-day -day activity, but determining the organization of cells in a multicell organism. The thing about these genes is that, unlike the regular genes coding for proteins needed by cells for daily activity, these developmental genes can be tweaked this way and that without losing any of the essential functions required for the cell to carry out the obvious processes of life, you know, metabolism and stuff. We call them developmental genes because one of the main things they do is to control the changes occurring in the multicellular organism as it develops from a zygote into an embryo, into a baby, youngster, and on through adulthood to eventually death. You were once unicellular, remember? That single-celled zygote underwent a cell division, and those cells underwent more cell divisions and at some point, some of the cells started to become different from the other cells. And as your cells continued to divide and undergo further differentiation, things had to unfold in a very precise way in order for you to reach your current state of development. All of that was under the control of developmental genes. Your regular genes that code for proteins and other important cell parts like ribosomes and tRNA, those genes are not appreciably different from the genes you'd find in a chipmunk. You are largely genetically identical to a chipmunk in that respect. What makes you a human and not a chipmunk are the developmental genes. It's like getting two boxes from Ikea, and all the pieces are nearly the same in both boxes. These would be the genes for proteins and such. However, the assembly instructions, the developmental genes, are different. And if you follow the instructions from one box, you get a chipmunk, while if you follow the instructions from the other box, you get a human. Do you see where I'm going with this in regard to the plausibility of mutations with large effect that don't kill you? As long as we have the important structural parts, the boards and the pegs and the screws and the pieces of plastic, we could ostensibly make small tweaks to the assembly instructions and put together a perfectly respectable item a chipmunk, or a human, or an elephant seal. A single mutation to the developmental program could cause a sizable change in the actual animal without compromising the basic functions of metabolism, reproduction, etc.
From a practical standpoint, our discussion in this class will revolve around two kinds of developmental mutation. One that affects the timing of developmental events, and we call this heterochrony, and one where there's a conversion of an existing structure into something different, and we call this homeosis. For now, you can think of these as two mechanisms by which a tiny mutational change can result in a substantial change in morphology, and hence make it plausible for a lot of evolutionary change to occur within a very short time span of dozens rather than thousands of generations. My favorite example of heterochrony involves this beautiful beast, the Axolotl, named after an Aztec god of lightning and fire, the Axolotl. It's basically a salamander, which not coincidentally, is also named after a mythical beast of fire, a salamander in the family Ambistomidae. Now, most ambistomid salamanders undergo a typical amphibian life cycle in which the animals are aquatic in the egg through the larval stages, and then they metamorphose into terrestrial adults. Like tadpoles are the aquatic larvae of terrestrial frogs and toads. Salamander larvae don't look like tadpoles, though. They have legs right from the start. So they basically look like drab aquatic versions of the adult salamanders, though with gills and a fin down the back and around the bottom of the tail. Sexual maturity occurs during the terrestrial adult phase, after the metamorphosis, when the fins and gills are reabsorbed and the adult skin coloration comes on. The axolotl is a salamander whose development has been reprogrammed. Its sexual maturity comes before metamorphosis, and so these guys can complete their whole life cycle without ever setting foot onto dry land, which is not a bad thing for amphibians that live in permanent ponds and lakes in those parts of the southwest of Mexico where there's plenty to eat if you stay in the water and you don't have fish predators that you need to escape. Okay, so you might think, big deal. So these are Peter Pan salamanders that just never undergo metamorphosis. Apart from that, they're essentially the same as they were before, right? Well, initially, yes. But what comes next for the axolotl is a brand new ecology, that of a full-time aquatic predator, now free from constraints imposed by the need to be successful on dry land. Just think about the limbs and the body size. These arm and leg things are still kind of useful, but not so much now that I don't need to support my body and move around on dry land. They might be saying this. And now that I no longer need to tootle around on dry land supporting my weight, it's not a problem for me to get bigger, more massive, and also longer because that would increase my efficiency moving through the water. All right, yes, I'm committing the sin of suggesting teleology and evolution. But what I really mean to say is that they're now free to increase their body size and reduce their limbs, as long as they never need to come up on the dry land. But it takes only one small change developmentally to trigger this dramatic change in the animal's selective pressures. And so directional selection from that point could result in relatively rapid evolution of reduced limbs and larger bodies. This could be happening in such a short time that it might leave no fossil record of the transition from small and terrestrial to large and aquatic. We'll be coming across a couple of other examples later in the evolutionary history of animals, where a heterochrony type change to the developmental program might have given rise to important world-changing evolutionary innovations. But now the other evo-devo mechanism, homeosis, will be a much more frequent theme in our later discussions. Envision an ancestral centipede-like animal. The body is segmented, with each segment being more or less the same as all the others. Each segment is equipped with a pair of legs. And let's say we start out with eight of these segments. So how does a body like this develop? Well, first you start with a fertilized egg which then undergoes a bunch of cell divisions to make what is kind of like a cylindrical salami. Then the salami self-slices into eight equivalent pieces, and from that point, each slice develops into a complete body segment. 
The same developmental genes are used to make all of the sections develop in the same way. That makes sense, right? All of the segments of our centipede are the same, and so you can reuse the instructions, which is way more efficient than having to use eight different sets of developmental instructions to make effectively the same body part. Once you have a slice of salami, it just follows the instructions to make a body segment. Now, hypothetically, you could increase the number of slices in that embryonic salami and end up with a larger number of perfectly good body segments. With a single change to the developmental program, one that controls how thick or thin the salami slices are, the body that you end up with can be dramatically different from what you had before. We know that segment doubling genes responsible for making thick salami slices split into two thin ones are actually for real and they occur in all insects. Moreover, once you make a greater number of body segments, you might have unneeded extras of some parts of the segments, like the legs in our centipede body plan. It might be nice to have all those extra body segments, but you don't really need all of those walking legs, and so it's not a problem for them to be either lost by retrograde evolution or to be repurposed for some new function that wasn't present in the original centipede. Maybe the legs, and we should call them appendages now because they're no longer always involved in walking. They no longer have feet at the end, for example. Maybe the appendages of the front segments can be repurposed to emphasize sensory function. They can grow long and thin, and this is exactly how the antennae of insects and crustaceans came to be. In spiders, those same front appendages were converted into chelicerae, the so-called fangs they used to subdue their prey. Remember that punctuated equilibrium is our context for discussing homeosis and heterochrony here. They have caught our attention because they show us how single mutations could result in substantial morphological change without being lethal. I need to point out that this is a different take on mutation relative to what we had discussed before. These developmental mutations of large effect would not be part of that slow, steady trickle of new allelic variations entering the gene pool over the course of millions of years. These are more like that favorable mutation scenario, the one that I said was not adequate to serve as your complete understanding of how mutations contribute to evolution. This is the end of Unit 1. Our discussion of evolutionary process has had three general areas of focus, microevolution, speciation, and macroevolution. These three are the ones of major importance. Additionally, we also had the opportunity to discuss sexual selection and a fair bit about the history and philosophy of evolutionary thinking. And this includes much of our first two lectures, as well as some of the many discussions later in the sequence. In the next unit, we'll start our tour through geologic time, the origin of life on Earth, and a survey of prokaryotes and the four main clades of eukaryotes.